Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our seventh reading in this, our 2021-2022 season. I'm Tom Hogan, the coordinator of the Milwaukee Poetry Series, and I want to thank you for being with us. We know that you have a lot of choices, and so we're very happy and pleased that you're spending some of the time with us. We hope that you're all safe and well in this time of the pandemic. I know one thing we've been noticing is the day is getting longer. As my wife Jane and I have been out walking, they just are getting more sunlight at the end of the day. It's a wonderful thing to see. And in two weeks, we're going to have daylight savings time. So that's even going to increase. We have a wonderful poet with us who I'm going to introduce in a moment. But before I do that, let me make some thanks. One thanks is to the city of Milwaukee for the support that the city has given us. Secondly is to the uh, Letting Library of Milwaukee. We are a committee of the Letting Library and we want to thank the Letting Library for their support. Thirdly is to the Milwaukee Poetry Series Committee. You know we have a group of people that are working on this and we don't have anything happen unless you have a group of people that are doing that and that's the case. So a big thanks to the Milwaukee Poetry Series Committee and finally, to the Willamette Falls Media Center and to our technician from Willamette Falls, Josh Reynolds, and to Bev Spurgeon, who is a committee member. And they are our technicians tonight, and they are the ones that are making all of this happen. So thank you to Willamette Falls Media, to Josh, and to Bev. Now, a poetry reading that I've been looking forward to. Jessica Tyner Meta is a multi-award winning interdisciplinary author and artist. She's born and raised in Oregon and is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. So we're going to hear a little bit more about that from Jessica during the reading. She is currently preparing for a Fulbright U.S. Scholar Award in Bangalore, India. We're going to hear a little bit more about that. She is a recipient of a 2021 Glean Portland Award, a Regional Arts and Culture Council Make, Learn, Build Award, and she is the upcoming poet in residence at the Hugo House in Seattle. She has three books, that's three books, released in the past year, including When We Talk of Stolen Sisters, Not a Pipe Publishing, Selected Poems, 2000, 2020, Meadow Like Books, and winner of the National Annual Birdie Prize, and Andy Pose, New Rivers Press. She is currently completing her PhD in literature at the University of Exeter in England. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that as well. You can learn more about Jessica at www.thischeroquerose.com. We're going to have a question and answer period at the end of the reading with me and my lovely wife, Jane, who is also here. And then Jessica is going to uh, end the reading with a final poem. Would you join me in welcoming our poet today, Jessica Tyner Meta. Jessica. Thank you. Thank you to Tom and Jane for having me here. I believe this is my first non-Zoom reading in at least one year, if not two, so <laughs> I am very pleased to be here. Um, so, Wado Osio Jessica Meta Dagwadoa. I am an Iyanwia from the Cherokee Nation, as Tom said, so my ancestral homelands are um, North Carolina territory by way of Oklahoma. Obviously, I am using the post-contact commonly used names for those born in what we called Oregon. So I have spent my entire life away from those homelands. I'm gonna start off by sharing the poem, The Seeds for Distinction with You, which is a bit of a nod to Thomas Jefferson calling for the need for extinction of Native Americans. Um, this poem can be found in my collection when we talk of Stolen Sisters. It is also archived with um, Split This Rock in Washington, D.C. as part of their Poem of the Week series from 2021. So um, prior to Jefferson's presidency, he was a colonel for the Albemarle County Militia, and he was later credited with starting the Trail of Tears. 
He um, called Native Americans noble savages, and the various routes taken during the Indian Removal Act, of which uh, my direct ancestors survived, were overseen by white conductors. Um, so during the Trail of Tears, the women sewed beanpole seeds into the hems of their skirts and dresses. And the Cherokee Rose is said to have sprouted along the trails from the women's tears to provide hope. The seeds for distinction. Conductor drives us the cow catcher barreling straight into the teeth of memory's harshest winter. Derailed and steam rolled, Agitzi's tears trail to track past the seeds sewn into skirt to crack like a spoon against kernels creme brulee. Add salt to taste, fold into the earth, let rise a rout of roses, ivory corollas birthed from all the gold they could not take. Conduct yourselves like noble savages. Conductor raises his baton. March to the beat of a nettle across neck. Cadenza, cadenza, we are not the removed. We are the movement. Largo to grave a whole orchestra of virtuosos with the drumming chambers keeping cadence. So the title poem, when we talk of stolen sisters, um, follows after this. When we talk of stolen sisters, we talk of bodies gone to ghost or given back for goodness as if we are sweets snatched from superettes, discovered post wash in sticky pockets. When we think on stolen girls, we imagine Pluckings from roadsides, wild flowers wafting honey sick, passed round, stuffed in vases to wilt before given back to ground. When we hear of stolen daughters, we listen with colonized minds, settle into armchair arguments, share, shake heads, repeat. When we read of stolen women, we say, but it's not me, my cousin, my child, my life, not really until it is. When we speak of taking us, it's not an outing, a going, a coming back round again. Stolen implies ownership, so who then owns these sisters? I'd like to um, just mention for those looking to support Native organizations who are working with the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, um, Sovereign Bodies Institute was um, really critical in supporting my doctoral work. They are based in the Pacific Northwest, and if you'd like to learn more about what's happening with this problem, not just in Indian country but beyond, I encourage everybody to um, take a look at Sovereign Bodies Institute. They're also providing support to families who are searching. So speaking of um, my doctoral research, which I know Tom and I are going to talk a little bit about in a bit, um, it focuses on the meeting point of eating disorders and poetry. This poem, And I Did Eat, sprung from my research. And for anybody who... Um, is really into Sylvia Plath, you might recognize something in here. Like any good atheist, all I do is write about God. Malum to malice, Eve was the first disorderly eater. Behold the riches of the body. The fig is no fruit gleaming, a crowning jewel birthed between folds of her hallowed self. Taste the unraveling of this inverted flower filled with male lovers of paper nests, tucked stings and crawling hope. Blossomed unto openings, they are blind, flightless, incestuous, desperate, a burrowing to freedom, freedom pardon the aggress. A woman loves a woman starving in traps, sure in this undoing. Enter petals open, ripen for my lips. What have I done? Lady, you beguiled me, and I did eat. So the opening lines of, like any good atheist, all I do is write about God, is taken from Platt's letter to who she called Father Bart in 1962. And she wrote, 
I am myself, ironically, an atheist. And like a certain sort of atheist, my poems are God-obsessed, priest-obsessed, full of Mary's, Christ's, and nuns. I would also like to say that the line, Eve was the first disorderly eater, was taken from the book Deprivation and Power by Patricia McEachern. Um, this poem also inspired an installation that is currently up at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art in downtown Portland. Um, it's still up for a little while longer. Um, and you will find faux apples strung along the ceiling, dipped in handmade soy wax and acrylic paint with this poem actually buried underneath. And there is broadsides of this poem available there as well. There is a singular fig in that installation. A lot of scholars believe that the fruit from Eden was actually a fig. Um, others say the pomegranate, but I will leave it at that. So my poem, Namesakes, um, I think a lot of Native folks can resonate with this. As you can tell by looking at me, I am white passing in a lot of people's eyes, not so much in Native people's eyes. Um, my father was Anianwia, my mother was white, and this is my origin story. My mother named me after her father she hated like buying Papo's notice with a fat grandchild would make up for anything. My mother named me after famous cowboys, then went and married an Indian herself. Meanwhile, her own mother said, no darker. My mom named me the second most popular girl's name in 1981 because firsts were for good girls without panic. My middle name was the same as a boy in sixth grade with greasy nails and dirty hair, so I said it was Colette. My mother was a surprise 15 years too late. In the hospital, her father said, she ain't much to look at, is she? And asked the nurse to name her. She chose Rita after her own child and nobody not nowhere ever could say a pearl was an ugly thing. My mother named me for a man she despised well after his girth had gone to skeleton and the coffin flies went still, but still, I thought a namesake should mean something good and holy, like clean slates, buried shames, and starting overs. So when I read this, I often ask the audience um, if they know what my first and middle name was. Do you all have any guesses? <laughs> um, my name was Jessica Cole, after the James Younger gang. Oh. Jesse James and, um, yeah. Which uh, my grandfather, my papo, thought that we were descended from, there's absolutely no evidence of that. I've looked into it. I think a lot of people say that. Um, but the poem Namesakes can also be found living on my website, This Cherokee Rose. It was kind of the titular piece of what was meant to be an in-person exhibition at Open Signal in um, Portland East Side, but the opening date was, I wanna say March 3rd, 2020. So it was just open for three days and that shifted into a virtual gallery. And um, you can find that on there along with um, ancestral photos, including of Papo and my mom with experimental poetry overlaid on it. Speaking of COVID, um, poets probably saw a ton of calls for pandemic poetry. I'm still seeing them. So this was my response. These are strange days, the world mourning as one. All my life, heartbreaks were solitary pursuits, and now naked streets wail back at the vacuum roaring inside. We panic by, arms pregnant with moly. Snowy softness brings us back to mama's arms. Remember, at one time, someone loved us. More than their own skin, breath, everything we've ever hunted and howled for is slipping off shaking shelves. When did home get so keeningly lonesome to bear? When we started waking up, look, just look, look at all the beautiful. By the way, Moly, M-O-L-Y, is um, the most common metal used to make guns. I did not know that before researching this poem. Mm -hmm. How I like my women is, by my standards, a fairly 
veteran or well-seasoned poem. Um, but I feel like, unlike other poems that seem that I seem to outgrow, or at least that's my perception, it stays a part of me. So I do still like to share it. How I like my women. I like my women slight and frail, bones hollowly light, rib cages pressed like prison bars against the skin. I love the women with stomachs caved in, divots carved like ice cream scoops below breasts begging to melt. It's the women with the lips like readied blisters, skin sauteed in good jeans and creams that remind me how exquisite we are and of all that I'll never be. Uh, so my poem, Found Nations, is also a partial title of what, an exhibition that just came down in the Pearl District. Um, the title of that was Strong Found Nations. And that was the Glean Award outcome that um, Tom had mentioned earlier. So Glean is a project that invites artists to have access to Metro or the Portland City Dump and see what transpires. We are required to have a majority of materials be found from, from the dump. I will always say I was a poet first. I'm now, most people would say, like a wholly multi and intersectional artist. Um, and yet every single quote unquote art piece that I produce has some element of text in it. And this includes strong foundations. Um, foundations is on that. So I had this idea when I started the Glean Project, considering it was the dump, that I would do something related to eating disorders. I imagine there would be all of these incredible finds that are like kitchen based. And I did find a few. I brought them home and they just didn't turn into anything, or I guess I didn't turn them into anything. And one time I went there and I fell in love with this huge chunk of rebar, concrete, wires coming out of it. The people working there estimated it was about 600 pounds. So of course that's what I want. Um, <laughs> I, so I asked them, can you like put this aside because they have fantastic volunteers there who can like put aside stuff for gleaners. And they said, well, we will try, but we can't promise anything. And I asked my fellow artists, like, is it there? Is it in our spot? And like, no, there's nothing there. And that was a bit heartbreaking. And that's such the right word because it looked to me like a huge heart. And I went there again, and I was there at the same time that somebody, I'm, they were doing some kind of construction work, was dumping all of these like somewhat smaller pieces of rebar and concrete and foundation materials. That being said, a few of them definitely weighed around 100 pounds. So those, um, those became strong foundations. I also found a mid-century typewriter that did need some work done, as well as some onion skin paper, which I'm very, I'm grateful to the Cracked Pots team because you could also say like, I'm looking for these specific materials and they found the onion skin for me. Um, because I started calling around to places like Office Depot and apparently nobody knows what onion skin paper is anymore, which is very strange to me because I grew up learning to type on a typewriter with onion skin paper. Um, I have apparently lost that skill. I had to completely relearn how to type on a typewriter and it was so <laughs> difficult. So I created nine pieces with this poem on onion skin overlaid on the pieces that also have um, handprints and my children's handprints on them in homage to um, murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. This happened, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, depending on how you look at it, in the summer and during the time that the mass children's graves were being uncovered in what we often call Canada on previous sites of residential boarding schools, of which um, my father survived and his siblings, or survived at least physically. During this time, um, the words, we were children, were written in red paint on the doors of St. Paul's Cathedral in Saskatoon, June 24th, 2021. And this was in response to the announcement of 751 unmarked graves found near the m former Maryville Residential School, if I'm saying that correctly, 
since that time, thousands of bodies and graves have been uncovered. The U.S. has basically not started to look or dig. So that's a long intro. Found nations. We were children sown as seeds, no babies gone to ghost. You interred us not in unmarked graves, buried sins and shames ill-covered. Readily and rather, we took to root in cherished gardens. Unearth us, cap to cradle, these bones never forgotten, tended, tender now by Unisi hands. We are not your foundations, stem walls and slab for slaughter. Brick by brick, we are nations found, called home to ever blossom. And it's kind of, um, it's, a, it's a rough segue, I'll give it that. This poem is Dominican Man, and much like the poem Namesakes, I typically ask people if they know who I'm talking about. Um, if you're a reader, you do know who I'm talking about, but maybe I'm not giving the best hint. Dominican Man. You want a Dominican man to not be a Dominican man. Act like the culture's rinsed clean off soon as the white gatekeepers say he did real good. You stack that Dominican man up real high, tangled parts and broken bits, an effigy thirsty to burn. Take that DR and saw the big R in half so it don't roll no more. Trills are too hard for some folks, but everyone respects a doctor. You say, Dominican man, tell us how, but how do you write and publish and sell misogyny and machismo, forced kisses and grabbing asses if you don't live and breathe and be it too? Dominican man, he opened doors wide like young thighs and everyone loves a gentleman. Any guesses? Do you have any guesses? <laughs> what I'm talking about? It's, um, it's Juno Diaz. And the um, sexual assault, harassment, uh, vast allegations against him. Uh, and the whole separation of artist and art that is an ongoing controversy discussion of which there is no answer. I'm just on a roll with this. This one is Pulitzer Prize pig. Um, <laughs> so I have some asterisks in here to protect his identity, though I probably don't really need to. And I've never known how to visualize asterisks when I'm reading. Um, so I'm going to borrow something from a fellow poet who uses this. Pulitzer Prize pig spoke of what it means to be as a man with a look, the look, that look, women were born knowing how to read. I knew that look, the look at 15. When the AP teacher crouched beside my desk in the dark while flashes of syphilis and gonorrhea shuddered across the projector screen. Still, even now, I hear the tired clicking of the tapes. I knew the look saw a look at 11. When grown men whistled at my unfolding hips and high school boys rolled Corollas along middle school parking lots with eyes that spider scurried pressed breasts. And I knew I saw that look, his look, at four. In the bathtub, I learned shame. I shot my father in the eye with a plastic alligator squirt gun and never bathed with open doors again. Pulitzer Prize pig sidled up close, nosed for nipple drinkers and sniffed out my slop. Trough walls are low but sticky, slick beside styes, and boars are happy with scraps. So when I had mentioned um, the in-person Cume virtual gallery at Open Signal with um, the photos of my ancestors and the experimental poetry, so that experimental work is um, collected in Antipodes, which released by New Rivers Press in January of this year. I didn't know if it would ever find a home. And I call these poem antipodes <clears throat> because they can be read forward or backward word by word instead of line by line, which is the norm with what's often called reverse poetry. 
If anybody knows <laughs> if there's a real name for this kind of poetry, please do reach out to me and let me know. I always preface this before reading an antipode. I've had a couple people say they have seen it or heard it before but can't recall where. I've seen it once or twice shared on social media as kind of like one of those like memes that get passed around, but I've never seen it called anything. Um, I've never seen it collected or um, published beyond something like social before. So I kind of stumbled across this when I was reading the memoir Educated, and I always mess up her name. I, Tara Westover. I know her first name's Tara Westover. I'm 98% sure of. <laughs> and there was a line in the book that said, um, wolf that I am. And I just kind of realized, oh, if, you, if that was backwards, it was I am that wolf. <laughs> and so thus began this project, and I challenged myself um, to write an antipode a day for 50 days. This is not like writing other kinds of poetry. It's so mentally draining at times. It's like putting together a puzzle. And at the same time, what's really interesting is that it still, it still sustains what I consider my poet voice. I can still very much tell that it's me. Um, and it somehow forces open different themes and symbols and subject matter than what I'm typically working with. Um, if anyone would like to try this, there's actually an algorithm on my site as well that automatically reverses anything that you type in. Um, this one is Awakening Bedrooms of Monsters, and I will read it in the forward position first. Monsters of bedrooms awakening in stumbles. Baby, the nightmares mean experience. Infants screaming for comfort, give milk and wash to diapers. Victim playing, victims blaming, innocence disappearing with understanding. Mama's afternoon, everyone full of drink. Fine, it's fine, it's history repeating and apples falling close. Kids having babies, thighs sealed with daddy watching. Night after night, nothing's different. Nothing's different. There is truth and there are lies. Your eyes are closed. We offered prayers to deaf gods. And in reverse, God's death to prayers offered. We closed our eyes. Your lies are there and truth is there. Different nothings, different nothings, night after night. Watching daddy with sealed thighs, babies having kids, close falling apples and repeating history. It's fine, it's fine. Drink a full one every afternoon. Mama's understanding with disappearing innocence. Victims blaming, victim playing, diapers washed, and milk give comfort for screaming infants. Experience mean nightmares. The baby stumbles in, awakening bedrooms of monsters. Wow. So when I mentioned um, with the work Strong Foundations, um, the handprints, and that my children's handprints are on that as well, so my children are um, adopted from the Oglala Lakota Nation in South Dakota. Uh, they were in three different foster homes. The first one, extremely temporary. The second one with a non-native family, which is quite unusual because um, the Indian Child Welfare Act, especially in South Dakota, where there's a relatively large amount of native foster homes, it's, it's strange to place Native kids in non-Native homes. Um, but this is, um, this is actually my only poem about my children. And it's called, I Fear My Daughters. I fear my daughters will only remember me as the mother with cold hands, not the mother whose belly they strained to distinction. I was not the mother who slapped the Lakota clean out their mouth with a skin color don't mean nothing anyway. We born in America, we all Native Americans. I was not even the kokum with shorn braids who slipped Cheerios and soap between puckered lips tight as their birth father's fist. But I was the mother who cleared the eczema with dollar store jars of Vaseline, bootleg bear grease and spruce salve. I was the mother who pressed good dreams into eyelids, conjuring sweet fantasies exploding through darkness. 
I am the mother who did stay, who could remain, who packs in the hurt and needs it into my own. Um, just a little information for folks who don't know, um, because of ICWA, only what they call tribally enrolled, but we're not enrolled, we're citizens, it's not a club, but only tribally enrolled Native people can legally adopt Native children except in what they call extenuating circumstances. It's very messy, um, but that's something a lot of non-Natives don't know, and it's a means of trying to stop, undo, slow down the erasure and assimilation that comes with removing somebody from their culture. So my poem, the title is Struck Through, Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women, is what is called a lipogram. Um, it was first, well, we, we trace it to mid-century France. And it works by, so the first stanza is missing a letter. I think the most famous lipogram is the Middle East is missing, if anybody wants to look that up. Mm. So um, I'm gonna read it to you. It looks, um, I'm gonna, I, don't, I don't know how well this will show. It looks a bit prose poetry-esque. Um, it's quite long, but you can tell just by listening that something is off and the something off is that something is missing. Mine is not the Middle East though. A girl gotta grow up, leave the res, and do we talk about it? A Guido called twice for bail, but both were after a Tahlequah fall and high with opioid, they drove right through a gate. Bolted up the highway, bare feet and all, hitched a ride via lifted truck to take her far away before 911 with the devil up and took the car. Dad left right out of jail, headed to the Pacific and gave away that plot of Cherokee a year later. You'd have hated it and I probably would have. No folks gonna talk of them gone ones anymore. They look at me all, got some blessing on y'all. After all, no cop has got me yet. No reason really. Everyone else, the whole family gone and sear to memory, the creak of a cell's cop frame long ago. None of y'all can fathom at the places gonna call for me. They gone and settled prefrontal cortex and that seems an okay place to some. At 15, we three bunked all day for an aged Ouija game. We'd all be dead by 23, and we laughed and made a bet for the chance. An ATV ate Anne at 18, and then a fancy cable hung by Althea came next. Hadn't even nudged me for that plan, and when death happened that way, we can't talk any decent way. No one talk anything of funeral one or two, and I kept lookout for a face I knew while the Catholic father went on and on about killing another or you, like no difference and praying for both. Father, what type of native turned Catholic anyway? Who tucked that in their brain all through junior year, neither talk of church or nothing. Creator not have a way to fix it then. Who up and say so long to that God? Why do Indians stand for the national song? So many of us wash away, walk away, drag and drug away, and nobody's coming back from that havoc of war. Some of us hate a couple, woe, tacked to the first of what we call big boys. But with Saligi, it's fixed. Asgeya, male, Ageya, female. Why make that M all a mess, wave wide those legs and smile? It's the first of the alphabet, debut of music, the call all of us made as we slipped to this place, and maybe that's the space us Agea go to. The alpha, the basis, the middle of this wasted home. I ran away, still a kid, and my mama said, why, 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 until kill pills kicked in. With my dad and sis, love y'all was last. With my mama, I try and say, I try, I try, I try. When they ask where we went, where we go, why gone permanent cloys and flanks so close, why holes and channels swallow with ease and no one asks or even seems to say, that's strange, remember, remember. Those who are gone never go that far. We are here, we stay. To be forgotten means an agreement's complete. That's not ever gonna happen. And so what um, 
you can't really glean from that is that, and again, I'm sorry if y'all can't see this. Um, so the first stanza, the M is missing. The second one, there's no U, there's no R, there's no D until it spells out murdered and ampersand missing indigenous women, repeating over and over. Mm. Place setting. I've never belonged at any table, but I pass the salt and looked up which fork to use in an etiquette book. All my family's dead, so nobody's left that knows there's an Indian girl with a sick head who grew up poor and sometimes likes to fuck women gone and snuck into this little fete. They don't look too close because I got no color and haven't been homeless in years. Taught myself how to talk right with sitcoms these days I only slip up sometimes. Usually, when the drinks kick in or in catching the smell of a fellow interloper, overlooked, uninvited guest. And we smile, tight lips coating teeth because a feast is always better when it's free and a gorging always sweeter for the starved. A whole idea of who has a place at the table. Okay, I'm at the tail end. I have two more for you before a talk. Um, one is Death's Usher. And this is written just because it is so true. And I fear that this is my fate, that this is my job. It's not right. Responsibility. Karma. I have cradled so many dying things in these arms, my breast is a slow beating graveyard. Rest open the brittle bars of my rib cage, the arching foyer to this wanting mausoleum. Guilt is so heavy, so much more slippery than sorrow. These hands know the subtleties between early leaving seizures and last no take back spasms. Death's usher, perched at the in-between, I'll ever carry those echoing tremors reverberating through my bones, another notch in my osteobiography. So many expirations I've blown out in coups and shushes. Let us talk gently to the moribund. This morning, after your stiffness settled permanent in my skeleton, I brought the red plums to a second boil drowned them syrup slow in saccharin pores, dumbly costive, as if sweetness alone might hasten the season to end. <clears throat> and the last one is Tower. Um, so currently I am working on a manuscript um, which was selected for my post as the poet in residence at Hugo House Seattle. I am decolonizing and indigenizing the tarot deck specifically the Smith Rider Weight deck, which is, if anybody has seen a tarot deck, it was probably that one. Um, it's the most popular. It's very white, it's very heteronormative, it's very problematic. The only non-white person in it is the trickster. So as I'm working on this project, which I'm um, collaborating with a local illustrator, Kendrick Payton, and it is under contract with Red Planet Books, an indigenous press for a 2023 release. It will also have a tarot deck and some other swag, so keep an eye out for that. The tower is typically seen as the most, if you will, negative card. I mean, that's thinking in a very binary sense. Um, but if you see a tower, it is quite destructive, no matter which tarot deck you are looking at. A lot of the lines from these are pulled from quotes related to the Twin Towers falling. Um, and I, I'll... I think they're important, so I'll, I'll save them to the end, though. Tower. Maybe they're just birds, honey, hungry, plunging, and not jumping at all. Recall, one cannot leap into the arms of God. None and all are falling man exposed in false tranquility. Can death be such? Swan dives through destruction, perfect parallels along partitions. When buildings burn, taken to hell with the devil, Mutiny prevails. In a dozen stills of stumbles, just one calls fervently of peace. We turn it round and upside down, make serenity of the storm, purgatory undone. We are freed. 
of the pipal tree shooting headfirst to aperture. That Olympus housed no gods. Two decades passed and still our Esquire has no name. No name except arrow, missile, spear, like a medieval Christ, one in six, the seven or eight percent, probably a food service worker or a light-skinned black man or Indian or Arab, definitely not poppy, but an essential element in the creation of a new flag. Daggers rain down amidst these crumbling col colossi, one after another, dove tailing in neat procession to unclaimed consecration. <clears throat> So this is mostly about um, Falling Man, which it, it's been a while, but if y'all recall, there was that one really famous picture of a man seemingly peaceful, like just diving downward. Um, that was actually one of many stills that is not the reality of that fall. And um, there was a lot of guessing and conjecture over who he was. The first line of this poem, maybe they're just birds, honey. That was actually a quote in Esquire. It was overheard by a mother comforting her young child as they were watching people jump. Um, the last two lines, we cannot jump into the arms of God, is from the same article. One of the first people who was thought to be falling man was a man named Norberto Hernandez. There have since been a lot of other people who have been named as falling man. One of his daughters, though, Catherine Hernandez, um, she said that they, her family got phone calls that said, my father was going to hell because he jumped on the internet. They said my father was taken to hell with the devil. Um, Catholicism, suicide. Um, yeah, so that, I, I thought, <laughs> I've been a tarot reader for many years. Uh, my mother taught me. I thought I knew how to read tarot, but when I started reading them through poetry, through a lens aimed towards decolonization, they took on a completely different life. Um, it's as painful as writing as antipode in a completely different way. And I promise you, my final, final poem after our talk will not be so depressing. <laughs> I try to save a non-depressing one for last. <laughs> Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jessica. And we are virtual, of course. But even with that, I'd like to have you hear sustained applause from the people that are going to be watching this reading as it comes up on the YouTube channel. Sustained applause. So thank you so much for everything that you've shared with us. Just some things that uh, stuck out to me, straight into the teeth, a rout of roses, drumming chambers, colonized mind, stolen implies ownership. Like any good atheist, all I do is write about God. <laughs> Naked streets wail back. This is something you said. I don't think it was in a poem. If you read great things, you're more apt to write great things. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> there are so many more images there that I could cite. So thank you for a very rich reading. Yes. We want to have some question and answers and just conversation. And why don't we start with a couple of things that were in your introduction or in the material that you sent me. And we talked about you saying a little bit more about it. And one is your Fulbright. Mm -hmm. Scholar Award and what you're doing in India and how that came about and what that's about. It's a bit of a compliment to a project that I undertook in 2018, 2019. So at that time, I was a fellow at Halcyon Art Labs in Washington, D.C. And I was brought there to curate an anthology of poetry by incarcerated or previously incarcerated Native women. And while I was doing that, I started thinking, well, I didn't start thinking. It really highlighted to me that when most natives are writing anything, including poetry today, we are doing so in the colonizer's tongue. Hmm. Um, we, a lot of us do our best to insert some of our ancestral language in there. And uh, my husband is from India. Um, 
obviously there's that whole messy history of Columbus thinking he was an Indian. He was very stubborn about it, and that's why mm. we became known as Indians. And then I'm also doing a postdoc fellowship on language and how it's evolving. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's a bit separate thing. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, so I'm thinking, like, um, there's also this entire other country, India, in which a lot of poets are writing in the colonizer's language as well. Granted, in India, they also have um, a lot of collections that are not written in English. But I'm curious about how, how it is, what is produced, when we are sometimes forced to write in a language that is not our own. There is a writing center at... Um, Christ University in Bangalore, um, arguably the most famed writing center in the country. And so I started communicating with faculty there if they would be interested in me, an Indian, my kind of Indian, um, coming there to work with their kind of Indians to see about curating an anthology in this shared forced upon us language. And I should clarify, um, obviously the term Indian to refer to natives is not good. Um, it's a bit reclaimed when I say it and when a lot of natives say it, we say it with the three letters in D in. So that's, that's what I'm saying. Mm. Um, so that is what I will, COVID permitting and all of that, be doing in Bangalore um, for mm -hmm. nine months. For nine months? Nine months, yeah. Right. Have you started on it? I have not. We are right now talking about what teaching might look like, if I will be taking on any kind of professorship. And it's still a bit just up in the air in terms of what is possible um, in, in terms of safety. Uh -huh. So, okay. Yeah, I will be departing no later than May 30th, though, if all, <laughs> if all goes well. If all goes well. Yeah. Yes, well. Yeah, we've been in the lurch for a year now. Yeah, well, fascinating. Mm -hmm. As a uh, connection to that, you mentioned a PhD. So I wanted to ask more about that and uh, the PhD that you're getting at the University of Exeter. So, and I think with the material you sent me that you were preparing or studying for a PhD, but yeah. it may be more here. And <laughs> what's the status of that and why the University of Exeter? I'm passed, my, my defense is passed now. You're passed. It, yeah, so I am, I am a doctor, I guess. Yeah, I'm a doctor um, of literature. Why Exeter is a complicated question. It was not lightly made, the decision that I would pursue. First of all, the whole concept of what we call higher education is a colonial concept. It's a colonial system no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. And then there's me who decided I'm just going to go straight to England to get my PhD. And I'm actually right now trying to figure out through departments how many Native Americans have received PhDs, um, and especially in the department. My guess, it's possible I'm the only one, mm -hmm. but I, I can't say that for certain yet. Hopefully I will know that soon. Um, my thought was, is it okay for me to go to England? Not is it okay, what would my ancestors think of me going to England? But then is it really so different than um, pursuing a program in what we call America? There were some very logistical things to consider. Um, you know, when you're in your 40s, you don't really want to upend your family and your life and everything to physically move and just drown and blanket yourself in school for four, five, six years. Um, there's two different tracks for PhDs in humanities in England, either teaching track or research. Mine is research. And then when you're research track, you are not taking courses. You have a master's. I have been told if you have a master's in your field, you are done taking courses. Um, that's not the case or it wasn't pre-pandemic at least, for the vast majority of doctoral programs in what we call the United States. So not gonna lie, the fact that I didn't have to take a bunch of classes and be there all the time was mm -hmm. a factor in it. Uh -huh. um, didn't have to take a GRE. I am uh -huh. very test averse. I'm very happy to see that the pandemic has shown that maybe these kinds of standardized tests or having to physically be somewhere five days a week 
actually maybe they're not necessary. Maybe you're still getting the same quality research. So I'm, I'm happy to see that. Mm. There was also the fact that um, it is so subject based on your interests in England. Um, you actually have to find a professor at the university who says, yes, I will basically, sponsor isn't the right word, but yes, they're saying I vouch for this person. You have to have a professor saying they will be your supervisor before you can even apply. That's part of the application process. That's worlds away from what happens here. Mm -hmm. I was in England for a poet in residency, totally unrelated to this, in Stratford-upon-Avon, which um, it was Hosking House's Trust, which is a phenomenal residency. They're still going. And I can't even remember how I stumbled across who ended up being my primary supervisor's profile, but his obsession and passion and love for Plath matched my own. And when I reached out to him, it was just to connect. I had zero thoughts of doing doctoral work. I thought that that ship had either sailed or it was like tucked away for a retirement plan. Now my retirement plan is an MFA at Iowa. <laughs> but he encouraged, he's like, why don't you do your PhD here? And so that's, that's, how, it, that's how it all began. Mm -hmm. And um, it's what everybody says. It's the whole process is beautiful and painful. Mm -hmm. And a lot of time you never want to do it again. But then there's thoughts like, but then I'm interested in this. So mm -hmm. um, when did was, it begin? Hmm? How long ago did it begin? It began in 2018. Yeah. So okay. basically, there were some weeks, especially during the pandemic, that was a lot of just sitting and waiting. I'm lucky to have been able to do the bulk of my archival research um, prior to the pandemic, prior to closure. So I spent weeks at Everett Helm, at um, Lilly Library. I was at the Rosenbach Museum for the Moore Archives in Philadelphia. I was at the British Library for Barrett Browning and Christina Rossetti. I got to have all of that. The only thing I missed was the Harry Ransom Center for the Sexton Archives, but the librarians, not just there, but everywhere, have been so generous and fast mm -hmm. and digitizing things that have never been digitized for doctoral students. It mm -hmm. was such a gift. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's also a gift that it's done. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. Thank wow. you. Okay, because your, your defense has just, has just passed. Yeah, they finally just said yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. When did you learn this? Yesterday. Oh. So it was yesterday well, so morning. Yesterday morning? Yeah, yesterday morning. Yeah. And after it, it was just the adrenaline. I've never had such an adrenaline high and then drop, and I was just so exhausted. Uh -huh. And then I have a sick child at home. Can I have another popsicle? And I'm like, fine. I'm like, just get it yourself. <laughs> I need to just sit here. But yeah, yeah it's, um, they finally gave the official word yesterday. Sure. So now mm -hmm. I am looking at... Um, commencement travel and all of that kind of stuff, yeah. so July. Okay, for July. Yep. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. You've told us that about Sylvia Plath. So who else are you reading? And who else would you say has it have influenced you? So I put myself on a research-only diet since 2018. And I mentioned I'm also doing Okay, technically, it's a postdoc fellowship, even though I didn't get the final go-ahead, you're good, until then. So there was an overlap, um, but I'm, I'm working with um, Forecast Change Lab as their current fellow, and I'm analyzing the language used in open calls for Native Americans in art. Um, they're a public art organization, but there's just simply not enough recent open calls for Native Americans in public art to make that in itself um, a research. So I'm, I'm looking at all kinds of art calls. So I'm reading a lot of things related to that. I just read Adrian Keene's, um, it's like 50 Notable Indigenous People, and then I learned about her podcast, which I listen to every morning because I get up at 3 a.m. So I have my meditation and my asana, my cardio and my strength training. So that's a good solid two and a half hours of podcasting every morning. And then she is interviewing native poets, um, Joe uh, Whitehead. Yes, I'm trying to make sure the first name is correct. Joseph Whitehead and Billy Ray um, Belcourt. So their books are arriving today. Um, I'm taking recommendations on what I can finally read for pleasure because even though like I haven't been able to do anything with the doctoral work as I'm sitting here like in purgatory. 
<laughs> I was like, but if I start ordering books, then that means they're going to say, actually, you need to rewrite the whole thing. We were wrong. Like, I thought it was some kind of like jinx, so I didn't let myself. Um, but I, I do think what still influences me, um, Lee Young Lee, I might... I might say Lee Young Lee, if you had to choose, is my favorite poet because I actually <clears throat> prefer Plath's prose a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and otherwise, oh, Beth Brandt um, mm. as well. I did like a little mini residency that had to be virtual in the autumn with Radar Productions and the San Francisco Public Library's um, LGBTQI plus community. And my research was looking at the history of two-spirit people in various tribal communities, and then I ended up with Beth Brandt's work, and then I ended up writing my own kind of homage to her name is Helen, and mine is her name was Rita, who was hmm. my mother, and it's being put to music right hmm. now, and I'll be performing it at Hugo House in Seattle, April 1st. Never read poetry with music before, so we'll see how that goes. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Send me recommendations. Thank okay. Thank you. Let's see if uh, my wife Jane has a question. Well, I'm intrigued. What got you starting to write poetry and, and your writing? How did that begin? For me, poetry has always been my most natural form of communication since I could write. I have poems that I wrote when I was six. Um, it's e I won't say easier. It's more natural than prose for me. <laughs> and I think, um, I think that can be true for a lot of people. It's just we think of poetry different today. but how do we introduce children to language and books? Usually through poetry, Dr. Seuss, phenomenal poet. And then in the past, I would say 80 years, I mean, because poetry used to be just in the weekly newspaper that was part of our life. And it started to become like, no, it's for very elite, highly educated people. And I'm not sure how that happened, but um, I think we need to, <clears throat> Hmm. go back a bit and remember that it's um, sure. it's how we learn language. It's how we learn to love hmm. language. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. There are so many more questions that we could ask, but time to conclude. Okay. So would you like to finish with a uh, final poem? Absolutely. Um, FYI, the line in here, is in reference to, there's a line in here that Toni Morrison fans might recognize. I'll share that at the end. So this is uncontainable. My body gleams the same shining cost as a new car. Gilded in gold, punctuated in gems. You ask, what would your mother think? She thinks nothing, she is dust. But if she were to rise up, gather her ashen self once more, then I say, she had delight in my adornments, diamond round doth, topaz to tragus, trace these inky birds sprung from skin, even the one who lied, I love you, to nest in lion's den and say, our bodies are no temples to keep and sweep pristine. Make of that fragile shell everything. You dream draped in colors, dripped in stones, shaken from earth, so when we return fragmented supernova, we can say, recall that once was canvas, Icarus footprints burned to brown and all the blinding beauty it spilt forth, uncontainable, uncontainable. Um, Toni Morrison is my favorite writer. Okay. <laughs> Um, the line, even the one who lied, I love you. The opening paragraph of Jazz. She ran then through all that snow, and when she got back to her apartment, she took the birds from their cages and set them out the windows to freeze or fly, including the parrot that said, I love you. Mm -hmm. Jessica, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank so you. This has been a, a fascinating and uh, rich reading. Thank you for being here. There will be some information following the credits on where you can get Jessica's books. A big thanks for joining us. Thank you for being here. Gary Like's going to be here uh, in April, so we hope to see you then. I'm Tom Hogan. Good night for the Milwaukee Poetry Series.